Today's been a full day, hasn't it? Started off at 8.30 with prayer and we're still going strong and I'll try hopefully not to give out before you do here this evening. I must say I am very humbled and pleased to hear the, the number of people who have come up to me, as Glenn just recently also shared, and said that um, they, they heard me ten years ago and uh, shook, shake my hand very enthusiastically and speak positively of that and they show up again. And geez, you had ten years to figure it out. But at any rate, it makes me feel good that you're, you're uh, welcoming me uh, back again. Uh, as Glenn said, we're going to look at maybe not quite such a happy theme this evening, We've titled tonight, Small Church Histrionics, or maybe hand-wringing would be uh, another way to say it. If we went back to our other alternatives of uh, yesterday evening, uh, for in terms of diagnosis, it wouldn't necessarily be a happy one. Or if we look at the present, we could say, well, we've gone downhill since the past. So we're going to look at problems and challenges and issues. And the reason we want to do this is that we want to look these problems right in the eye and hopefully they'll blink first. But I am tired of uh, when, I, when one advocates for the small church of having folks say, well, you're, you're just denying the reality that's out there. We want to look at reality and, and uh, address it as best we can this evening. Again, I want to hold up a couple of touch stones uh, before we get in uh, to the evening, and one is a biblical word. I want to look at the story from John chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. Hopefully it'll be a story that's familiar to, to most of you. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, Jesus asked him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and walked. Here's a gentleman who was impaired for 38 years. In all of that time, he was unable to receive the cure that had been provided to others. He was looking for salvation in the old ways. He was looking for salvation from somebody else. Just hold that image in your mind. We'll come back to it. I'd like to tell you about another one of my churches as we get started this evening. This is a church that has had a very rocky relationships with its pastors. Four out of its last five pastors left unhappily for uh, whether the impetus was on one side or the other. They parted uh, not very pleasantly. And the one pastor who did leave under happy circumstances was a gentleman over 80 years of age who, uh, which nothing uh, could faze him. So when I talked with the deacon chairman about their pattern of not having positive relationships with their pastors, he challenged me and said that I was inaccurate about that. And I said, well, tell me, what was a pastor that you've had a good relationship? So he said, Reverend so-and-so. Reverend so-and-so, I never heard of him. So well, when did he pastor there? Oh, about 30 years ago. I said, oh, that's good. <laughs> Nevertheless, they're a church that... Uh, really wants to do something significant for the Lord. And I met with them and challenged them to enter into a redevelopment covenant that we are uh, working on with among our churches who want to move into a different future. And the, the deacons thought that was great, and I presented it to the whole congregation. And I told them that this would involve change, and that it would ne not necessarily be a happy experience for them. 
that the only person that likes change is a wet baby. (laughs) And they heard me go on and on about the pain of change, and they still voted unanimously to enter into the redevelopment covenant. Okay, so then we find a pastor who could, uh, we, we hoped and trust, could help bring some freshness to this congregation. And we had him come in and meet with the deacons, and uh, they were excited about it. But as they were finalizing all the arrangements, they asked him what color robe he had. And he said, well, I don't have a robe. Oh, man. Then we literally went into a 40-minute discussion about the importance of wearing a robe in the pulpit. Church that was really ready to change. (laughs) Not too long ago, I had a series of phone calls and visits and everything. There's a gentleman in the congregation who has some kind of uh, uh, dysfunctionality, and he decided that the pastor was a problem. And before one worship service, he lit into the pastor with all kinds of four-letter words in front of the organist and up and down and stormed out of the church. I think the pastor was totally stunned by all of this. And I was totally stunned by the response of the congregation, which was to give all kinds of um, uh, leeway to the young man who acted so inappropriately and to bring all kinds of consolation around his mother and to ignore the pastor. Or not ignore, but relatively speaking, at least ignore the pastor. Now here's this church that you just wonder. (laughs) Are they going to make it? Can they stop from tripping over themselves to even make one step forward? Hold that image in your mind. So we look at the problems and some of the sicknesses and challenges that small churches wrestle with if they're going to move into God's tomorrow. I want to look at seven issues that confront our small churches. If we are to become spiritual dynamos, we must somehow address these issues and deal positively with them. The first of these is the issue of the spiritual core. Spiritual core or maybe I should say the lack thereof. I made a really big mistake, almost a fatal mistake, when I entered in and became an area minister some some years ago, and that was I assumed that our churches had a spiritual core. We have a cottage in Maine, and uh, we share a tree on the border with our neighbor, and the neighbor said that he noticed that the tree was not doing so well and probably should come down and would we split the cost of bringing the tree down? I said, yeah, sure. Looked at the tree, and yeah, indeed, it didn't look very healthy at all. So he hired this arborist, or I don't know what the term is, but this guy could really climb up and down these branches with a buzzing chainsaw. And he was quite a sight to watch. That was worth the price of admission. And yeah, he <laughs> cut up all the limbs and then chopped down the, the uh, trunk. And there was just laying on the ground. I went up and looked at it. And it was an interesting um, thing to observe. The outer ring of the trunk was wood, but the inner part was a kind of a mush that was filled with millions and millions of ants. I've never seen so many ants in all my life. And they were, the tree was just dying by inches until it, until it was cut down. Its core had been eaten away. And see, I assume that churches had a spiritual core And what they needed was methodologies and techniques and strategies and how-tos to implement the gospel. What I found was that they really needed was the Spirit of God and a heart after God and a passion for God's kingdom and an ability to focus on God's will. And instead, they'd substituted preservation of history. I mean, I'm all for history, but that should not be at the core. Or musical... uh, Preservation, we've got to keep that organ running. Or the fellowship circle. This group that have been my friends for half a century, they're what's important. And if anybody new comes in, we can't just add them to the group. They disrupt these established relationships. So we repel them or to maintain the building. All of these things and others have been substituted for the core, but it's not of 
the Lord. I go to uh, worship services and from beginning to end. One I remember, the only time Jesus or Christ was mentioned was in a hymn. Have another church. And I go to many churches and talk with them about their future, and it's amazing to me that often I'm the only one that'll use the word God or the term God's will that whole evening. We'd be meeting for two hours. I had a pastor call up and chuckle, and she said, a lay person used the word God in worship today. And I said, oh yeah, yeah, they were giving me a present. This was around Christmas time, and they came up and handed me a box of Godiva chocolates. <laughs> and the lay person says, anything that starts with the word God can't be all bad. <laughs> there was the use of the word God. Where is the yearning to do God's purpose? Where is the impetus in our heart to align with the Almighty and the call of God for us? Duncan McIntosh talks about a hot spot in a congregation. I think that's intriguing. Because in our small churches, I think sometimes we want to bring the whole group along. But sometimes you have to start with that one or two other persons who have even a glimmer of what it means to have a heart after God's will. And work with them, pray with them, meet with them, reinforce them, strengthen them, and also receive strength from them uh, to try to build from uh, something there that God may yet touch the congregation. Carl Dudley tells a fascinating story about an inner city church that felt that its days were numbered and they were just going to clean up and close down and, and, and dissolve as a congregation. So every Tuesday they met for a brown bag lunch of remaining members and they started cleaning up. And they went to this closet and they'd pull out things and, and, as, and throw out trash and this and this. But as they pulled out things they'd remember, oh! That's the baptismal robe. Remember, da 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 da, when Susie came to the Lord. And then, oh, remember vacation Bible school? Look at all these supplies left over. And they were having such a good time that they started inviting friends the Tuesday afternoon at the church. And then they invited the neighbors to open the doors. And before you know it, they didn't have to close the church at all. In fact, they reopened with life and energy because they had found in their memory how God had touched them in the past and they lived into that ongoing dynamic of God's presence. That spiritual core. If there isn't a spiritual core, there isn't anything else. You've got to start there. The second issue... Uh, called the issue of the guest or the stranger. The Greek word sanya is an appropriate word, I think, to use here. It can mean both stranger and guest. And I guess the question is, how can we become a welcoming and safe place for visitors? I believe that it takes a lot of courage for somebody to come to church for the first time or to come back after many years. How are they treated when they approach our churches? I'm going to ask now that some of you are ready to pass out some papers, and this is a handout that I hope will be of use to you. And as it's being passed out, I'll just put in a, a commercial word here. This, this handout comes from the Five Stones, which is a newsletter for small churches that I edit, and that's uh, distributed in Canada by the Settles. Uh, if you don't know Lester and Marion, please... Uh, make their acquaintance and uh, check out with them how you can get on the subscription list. And they also publish Rural Gleanings, another uh, good magazine and newsletter for, for small and rural churches. And uh, we, from time to time, steal some of each other's better articles. So we uh, have, have fun uh, relating to one another that way. Most of you have a copy. This was an article I wrote out of, I guess you could say, bitter experience. I wrote it tongue-in-cheek. 
I have to sometimes tell people that because otherwise they take it literally. It astounds me, but at any rate, the title of this little article is 10 Excellent Ways to Make Sure Visitors Don't Come Back to Your Church Ever Again. And these are actual practices, field tested for decades. I can assure you that they work. <laughs> and they've all happened to me one level or one time or another. We won't go through it every last one of them, but just to hit a few of them. Make sure that potential visitors, ha visitors have to work hard to find out what time the worship service is. Don't announce it anywhere, or if you do, make sure it's wrong. Number three, make sure there's no sign announcing your church. Or if you have a sign, make sure nobody can read it, or again, the information contained on it is inaccurate. That'll throw them off. Make sure that they can't park anywhere close to the church that all your regulars hog all the spaces right there. Um, all right, number six, we live in a world that likes options, so we have, a, we have an option here. Make sure that anyone who does make it through the front door is A, completely ignored, or B, surrounded and jumped on by all the regular members. <laughs> Either way works 100% effective. <laughs> make sure that folk have to climb over uh, your members to get a seat. Um, number eight is one that's dear to my heart. So far I have very few uh, converts, but I feel that when somebody comes to worship for the first time, that there's a, some kind of spiritual impetus. Their soul needs something. And when the first wor words they hear from the pulpit are, oh yeah, remember the trustees are meeting Tuesday night, and Thursday night's the ham and bean supper, and geez, whoever so was supposed to clean up the church last week didn't show, so uh, get on the ball. Uh, and I'm just not feeling that's really going to fill their soul too much. But. And then number nine, make sure that the bulletin is filled with all kinds of code words. I mean, we're a secret society, right? We don't just want anybody to walk in and get it. So we have cold words, surprise actions, and lists of funny labels. And don't put anything substantial in the bulletin that they could mull on just in case your sermon's not fully captivating. We've developed a system to actually exclude folk from the church. And I, I hope you'd actually take this home and talk it over with your leadership and see which one of these practices you're engaged, which ones you're engaging in, which ones you might want to change. And uh, you can blame it on me because I should be home by then. <laughs> can we develop a heart for evangelism? Can we really care about the visitor who comes to us or the ones that we could reach out to and invite them to come to us? Can we get the same excitement in our congregation that occurs in a family when a new baby is about to be born. The most disruptive thing in my life was the birth of our first child. After Becky came, I did not get a full night's sleep for five years. It knocked me off my pins in terms of balance and rhythm and all of that. But there's then she helped me get, achieve this white hair. But nevertheless, there's it's also now one of the most rewarding things to have been a dad to Rebecca and Jason. You've got to pay the price for new life. Can we have in the church the same excitement about new people coming to the Lord that we do in our families? There's an interesting quote from Harmon Killebrew. It says, My father used to play baseball with my brother and me in the yard. Mother would come out and say, You're tearing up the grass. And dad would say, We're not raising grass we're raising boys. When you get new people into the family, it's going to be disruptive. It's going to wear out the rug or spill coffee or tear up the grass or whatever it may be. But you've got to ask the question, what are we here for? Are we here to bring transformation into the lives of our neighbors? And if we are, then we've got to do whatever it takes. The third is the issue of health congregational health. I'm not going to spend too, too much time on this because I understand you've been wrestling with these issues. 
But let me just say a few things. One, ill health is often manifested in the games that we play. And we've, we've, we've got some very interesting games that we have devised to play. We, we play the blame game. This is a favorite. When things go wrong, the last thing you want to do is learn from the experience. What you want to do is find out who did it and how we can embarrass them. That is very helpful. We also play the victim game. Oh, we're powerless to change things. The neighborhood has changed in ways we can't undo that. The younger generation, they're not interested in religion. Our pastor, well, if he could only get a clue, you know. <laughs> we're just poor, innocent victims. Woe is us. It's a great litany if you don't want to take responsibility, if you don't want to take the responsibility that God has given you. Another game we play is love never means having to say you're wrong. We're so nice in the church of Jesus Christ. Well, some of us are so nice. And what happens is that some folk that aren't so nice are given license to do whatever they want. One of my congregations had for 20 years a bipolar, a gentleman with bipolar, uh, who suffered from bi bipolar uh, disease or whatever the proper title is. And when he was okay, he was okay. But you just never knew when the next eruption was going to happen. And so you can imagine that when he had a blowout in the Sunday school room, which he did, that parents would take their kids and go home and not come back again. And that people who were healthy would get tired of this dysfunctional congregation and float away. And what you end up left with is a bunch of very loyal, persevering people who can't call others to accountability. It was not a happy situation. But being a Christian doesn't mean being nice to everybody. It means speaking the truth in love when you have to. Let me just quickly go through a laundry list of uh, some of the characteristics of health that uh, emerge in an emotional climate in the church. Emotional climate is, I think you know what that is, when you walk in, you just kind of, it's the vibes you get. You just kind of have a feeling about this place. Um, it's very hard to specify, but it has some of these things may help us with it. One is joy. Is there happiness here? Do people smile and laugh? Is there an occasional joke told from the pulpit? We have one of my pastors is from Britain, and he's very prim and proper, and he's a very compassionate guy, and he decided that his preaching was too dry. And so every Sunday for a year or two, I think he's stopped now, he would start worship with a joke. He'd announce, here's the joke for the week. So you knew it was coming, and you knew you could laugh when he paused. But he was working at developing himself at the happy edge of the congregation. I take my hat off to him. We're the best jokes in the world, but what the heck. <laughs> is it safe when you walk in? Is this a place where you do not have to fear, where you will not be abused? Do we solve problems here, or do we play the blame game? Is God's will central or peripheral or even not factored in? What do we do with conflict? We'll come back to that later. Is maturity something that we actively strive for, or is it an unknown concept? It's the work of the church based on the giftedness, the spiritual gifts that God has given to each believer, or are people's arms twisted and coerced to do what somebody else thinks needs done in the congregation? And is it a place of affirmation? Somebody said it takes 30 attaboys to overcome one criticism. And I don't know if that number is exactly right, but boy, it's sure something like that. Is it a place of affirmation? And is it a place of spiritual health? One of the most helpful um, models that I've come across recently is uh, one by uh, Scott Peck, where he's talking about four stages of spiritual growth. And it only takes about, buried in the middle of his book, Further Along the Road Less Traveled, 
but I want to share it with you because it's been so very helpful to me and I hope it will be helpful to you also. It says that, that um, the typical journey for people in their spiritual journey is uh, four stages and he's simplifying other thinkers who have more complex models. Uh, but he says the first stage is when you're undifferentiated, when you can't tell the difference between yourself and the world, the difference between yourself and God. Well, babies are that way. You cry and uh, magically your, your needs get met. But he says there's two other people, that, uh, two, two other categories of adults that fall into this category. Uh, one is psychopaths and the other is televangelists. <laughs> well, most of us grow out of babyhood and we grow up to accept a view of the world that's presented to us. We don't have to build it, we don't have to figure it out, we don't have to articulate it. Our parents, our teachers, our Sunday school teachers present us with the view of the world. And so in the church we come to take on faith. And that's good. We don't want to have to develop all the truths of Christianity from zero. It's good to have them presented to us but it's the second developmental stage. The problem with it, though, is that it is somewhat secondhand. Somebody else built it and polished it and shaped it and handed it to us and asked us to swallow it. So the third stage that Peck describes is uh, one of skepticism, of denying or opposing or rejecting a lot of that which was handed to us uh, is so uh, thoroughly and so thoroughly worked out and so systematically. I think people used to go enter this skeptical stage uh, in college. Now I think of maybe it's junior high school or something. Society is moving along. One of the problems is that most churches are violently opposed to the movement from the second stage to the third stage. The second stage is formal and the forms are important. Third stage is chaotic, unclear, scary, and many of our long-term members in the church still have formal religion. The forms of religion are very important to them, and for them to have someone question or challenge is to deny. And so we put a barrier after the second stage, and we make it very difficult for our young people or new converts to move into that third stage. But Peck says that the third stage is necessary if we're going to get to the fourth stage, which is mature or attained faith. This is where we hammer out what we believe to be truth for ourselves. And it might vary a little from one of us to the other. We may have different emphases or whatever. But the point is, we thoroughly believe it because we have lived into that. Now, a lot of people never get to that, that stage. Some people are lost or stopped at the third or at the second stage. But wouldn't it be wonderful if we could develop communities of faith where it was okay to move beyond formalism. It's okay to challenge the, the accepted wisdom of the congregation because we're creating a safe space where you can work into that mature faith that you and the Lord build as you wrestle with the truths of life. Wouldn't that be a wonderful place for our churches to get to? Okay, the fourth issue has to do with conflict. Conflict in the life of our churches. So let me ask if you'd pass out the second sheet at this time. I'm hoping that these two handouts will be of use for you today and back home and in the weeks ahead. So I wanted to take a little bit of time and nuisance to, to um, get them into your hands. One of the things I want to say about conflict is that it's, it's a necessary and a good thing if it's done spiritually. We Baptists, I know not everyone here is a Baptist, but I'll, I'll confess. Uh, we Baptists have a dilemma. We believe in soul liberty, which is an invitation for each person to come to their own position on every matter. And as you come to your own convictions on every matter, you also come to believe that everybody else who has a different thought is wrong. So we have a built-in invitation to be in conflict. 
and we have lived into that uh, to a great measure. Um, I wrote this article, and I want to look at points three through six here. You can look at the others at your leisure. Um, it's an article just came out about a month and a half ago in our Massachusetts American Baptist newsletter. They'll, and they'll know we are Christians by our... And I asked the question, just what... Would somebody who's not a Christian know how know if we are Christians? What characterizes us following Jesus Christ? And I write a lot in our newsletter and other places. This article has engendered the most response of anything I've ever written. I go to meetings at a church and somebody will have photocopied the article and handed it out to all the members there. It just astounds me. So I, there may be something here that I it's beyond me, but I liked the... Um, Numbers 3 through 6 have to deal with conflicts. I'd just like to read them to you. Conflict is a sign of life. We needn't be afraid of conflict. It's not something to be avoided unless it's violent or destructive. Disagreeing is how God gets a word in. Who listens to God when they already know all the answers? Who changes without pressure? Who leaves their comfort zone without a shove? Conflict is not sweet, but it is necessary. Now, Christ would have us respond constructively to conflict. When conflict emerges in the world, usually one of three things happens. Fight, flight, or freeze. But in the church, maybe we could listen and learn. Negotiate and adapt. Discern and obey. Repentance, transformation, and reconciliation are the desired outcomes when Christians fight. Not victory, nor separation, which I consider to be a sign of gross immaturity. Separation is only acceptable when one party declines the spiritual blessings of repentance, transformation, and reconciliation. We need to learn in the Church of Jesus Christ how to disagree agreeably. And let me just give you some really nitty-gritty practical stuff. And I'm almost embarrassed to get down to this level uh, in the setting of academic wisdom. But it's so necessary in my churches that I'm guessing it's probably comparably necessary in your churches. So just give me a moment here, if you will. One is that we need to have a heart of mutual respect if we come in believing that I'm right, so you've got to be wrong, and I can learn nothing from you, we'll not be able to get along well. Secondly, we need to take responsibility for where we are, are at. We need to do what's often called I statements. One of my uh, folk on Block Island was a real rough, tough kind of street guy, and he was trying to learn some of these ways to... Uh, Ha go through conflict in a positive manner. And so he learned about I statements. And he explained to me how it really was a hard thing for him to learn because usually he'd say something like, you're a jerk. And then when he learned about I statements, he thought that meant, I know you're a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> but I statement is just stating where you are at. This, when you say that, I feel this way. Or I'm very anxious about that position that you've just espoused. Or whatever it is, it's owning where you are at and not projecting onto the other person the cause of your, the state that you're in at the moment. Speak the truth in love. And I've had to learn some scripts. Simple stuff, but they, they're very helpful for me. And I'll say things like, well, I appreciate what you're saying. I'm trying to listen to you. But where I come from, it feels different. And then I go on to say whatever it is I have to say. I don't know if that script would work for you or whatever kind of script you want, but learn some ways of respecting the other person. And uh, I was at a Sunday school class Sunday, and the pastor was going on and on, and somebody brought up a point, and the pastor basically said, No, you're wrong. Well, person I don't think was wrong. They were just raising a question there. But it was intriguing to me how um, we can uh, invite conflict and hurt by not being careful about how we interact with others. 
And then also the advice from Matthew 18, or not the advice, the prescription from Matthew 18. When we have a problem with somebody, let's go to that person directly rather than go to somebody else and talk about how bad the first person is. And if you don't have the strength to go to that person directly, take another Christian brother or sister with you and go. But you won't learn anything and you won't help that other person grow if you don't put it on the table with them. Okay, fifth issue has to do with pastoral concerns. First thing I'd like to talk about is tenure, and I may be going to meddling here. I think pastoral tenure in a small church and a rural church is very important. I believe, and this is not magical numbers, but somewhere between five and ten years, significant ministry occurs in a pastorate. It often takes five years in tribal settings, rural settings, traditional settings, to build up enough trust so you gain access to the depth of people. And if you've moved in the second, third, or fourth year, you're not you're going to have to start over again. And I think this is the problem in some of our, well, one of the problems in many of our churches is that the pastoral turnover is so great that the effectiveness is diminished. And I know that there are financial issues, uh, yokes, and a field of uh, churches can often put a lot of pressure on the pastor. I, um, I know that there are... Um, Dynamics at work that make it likely and desirable even for pastors to leave early. Even congregations collude with this. If they've had a series of pastorates that have ended in the third or fourth year, and you are entering the third or fourth year, all of a sudden nobody likes you anymore. You've experienced this or you know somebody who's experienced this. The congregation is protecting themselves from your departure. They're pulling in emotionally because they know you're going to leave just like everybody else has. And if you're not wise to that dynamic, you might just go right out the door feeling that uh, they have asked for this when really all they're asking for is to be loved over time. It's not easy, this tenure issue, but I do want to hold up as an ideal a tenure somewhere in the five to ten year range. Leadership postures of the pastors, another issue, and I have, I was talking with Randy about this, of two kind of ways in which pastors can uh, lead, in, lead ineffectively. One is that we uh, become only maintainers. We're very good at uh, caring for folk and helping people with their issues and holding their hands and uh, leaving what is be, but we're not very good necessarily at leading into the future. The other end of that spectrum, though, is that we become clumsy idealists. We think that we've got the vision for the kingdom, and the folk just ought to line up right behind us and uh, help one, two, three, let's march right into the kingdom. There's got to be somewhere in between where we preserve our vision for what God is doing, but we care about the people and walk with them in a productive way forward. And I call that place in between chief leadership. Remember, I'm working out of this tribal model. Where you've taken the time and expended the effort to know the people. You know what their joys and their pains are. You have folk with you who can help with the leadership whether it's your deacons or a council or a team or whatever you want to call it, who will be a sounding board and a, 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 feed, a mechanism for feedback and bringing things to you. Now, I want to just put a, some comments in parentheses here at this point because I have, in the last 24 hours, received a certain amount of guff about my comments about intentionality. Now, I don't receive... Uh, guff lightly here, so I want to clarify what, I, what I'm about here. Tribal system, which is the small church, I don't believe responds to the appeal of intentionality. 
it works out of tradition, habit, and routine. But the leadership function in the congregation, which hopefully will be the pastor and a few key lay leaders, have got to be thoughtful about what God is calling you to do and be in the days ahead. The environment is changing rapidly. We can't just work out of tradition only anymore. It might have worked in the 1600s, but it isn't going to work now. So there has to be an attentional component to the leadership of a small church. I just think you have to find some other ways to package it when you're selling it to the rest of the folk. Because they're not going to buy your left brain logic. Nevertheless, this chief leadership will bring around him or her those partners in the leadership issue. The chief will also be able to read the environment so we have a sense of who's out there, what their needs are, and what the trends are. And we'll be able to focus the congregation on the few things that will bear fruit. Small churches are not going to be able to do 800 new programs. If you do one or two additional things or new things or fresh things or things differently this year as opposed to last year, that's probably going to be a good year for most small churches. What are those one or two? That's a real leadership issue. Okay. Uh, Sixth issue is that of relevancy, or we might say irrelevancy. And I think of this as a little quote here. I could just see somebody taking the title of this series seriously and saying, yeah, sure, our church is a dinosaur, but it's our pet dinosaur. <laughs> we have to be very careful because, as I say, the environment is moving very rapidly and, at least in, in the United States, and I'm sure similarly here, has moved significantly away from the church. And that TV show, Married with Children, the blonde daughter is on the phone in one episode and she's making an arrangement to meet her friend to go shopping and they're going to meet downtown at the church. And she says on the phone, you know, the church, the church! The building with the T on top. <laughs> That's the image that many people have of the church. Mike Regal, who's the um, president of uh, Percept, and has done a lot of demographics for the Christian community, he says we're now entering into the third generation of ignostics. Not agnostics, uh, but ignostics. People who are ignorant of anything to do with the Christian faith. They don't understand anything about Christianity. They're comparable to heathens. The third generation of ignostics. We cannot assume even the most basic knowledge of Christian truth. Lauren Mead says that the church is not even a blip on the current generation's radar screen. Well, how can we be a little more relevant? A couple of thoughts. One is... I think we should recognize or redefine salvation as points of salvation. Some of us that come out of a revivalistic tradition think that, you know, you get saved. Over here you're a sinner, you get saved, and now you're a saint. Well, maybe. But it seemed to me that when Jesus met people in the Gospel records, he always interacted with them at the particular point of their need and did not talk with them about general, about salvation in general, but about what salvation meant for them at that moment as an individual. People have plenty of points of needs, relationships, parenting, finances, handling their emotions, health, retirement, employment, the needs go on and on. If we were to attempt to bring salvation to any one point of need, we may be doing a good thing and connecting with where people really are at. Secondly, I think in the church we ought to become models of people on a joyous adventure. We ought to see our faith as a happy experience that's leading us onward. We're in movement. We have packed our bags, or put on our knapsacks, 
and we are changing. God is urging us on. This was, I'm going to read a couple paragraphs from a church, one of my churches in their newsletter. They quote two letters. Letter number one, letters that were received by the pastor in regard to music on the Sunday service. Please, no more new hymns. What's wrong with the inspiring hymns with, with which we grew up? When I go to church, it's to worship God, not to be distracted with learning a new hymn. Last Sunday's was particularly unnerving. While the text was good, the tune was quite unsingable, and the harmonics were quite discordant. Letter number two. Was it the organist's idea or yours? See, I love this blame thing. That, your, that, our, that our peaceful worship service was shattered by that new hymn last Sunday. The music was sacrilegious, something one would expect to hear in a den of iniquity, not a church. <laughs> Don't even expect me to sing it next time. Now what's intriguing about these letters is that the first was written in 1890 and the hymn was, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. <laughs> And the second was written in 1874 in regard to the hymn, I Love to Tell the Story. If we could just have the conception that we're moving on, we're packed lightly here, we're on a joyous adventure, it's fun, I think we would be able to connect better with folk in society who really don't want to go back to 1890 to find good hymns. And then we also have to care enough to refocus. In a uh, small town in mass society, the um, authors write about the churches and how they um, struggle to get new members. And he says that, number one, the, those whom they want to become members are the folk who are like them who don't want to have a spiritual experience with Jesus Christ, or at least not with those folk. Whereas, at the very same time, there's another group who are different from the folk in the church who are desperate to be touched by Christ's love, but the folk in the church don't want to talk to those folk. The book was written a long time ago, but I don't think the situation has changed very much. We need to deal with the issue of relevancy, and we need to connect with people's real lives. All right, one last point. I think I'm running out of time here. Uh, the issue of invisible barriers. And I'm going to point to three real quick. Um, we talked a little bit about this uh, at the talk back hour this afternoon. First one is numeric. There's a barrier in many of our churches somewhere around 125. It'll vary a little bit. But about 125 seems to be the number of relationships that one can have in an extended family and maintain them and under, you know, know about folk and care and relate to people uh, individually and personally. When you get more than 125, then we get, enter into relational overload. And what happens is, unless there's phenomenally good leadership involved, the, uh, the, the congregation will react against the quantity of relationships and push 10 or 20 or 30 people out the back door, not maybe literally, but relationally, so they get back down in a range that they can handle. Uh, so a barrier occurs there. Second barrier has to do with style. I uh, talked about the robe, and the deacon was insistent that the robe was a sign of respect. And I said, well, maybe it is to you, sir. But I'll tell you, my kids would laugh at somebody who wears a robe. It would not engender respect. Organ. How many of us like to hear organ music on Sunday morning? Wow. Not only a minor fraction of you all. You're, you're supposed to be the ones who like it. Who does like it then? Well, we know who doesn't like it. Anybody who's in their 40s or lower, 90% actively dislike organ music. Interesting phenomenon. Monological conversation. 
My kids will put up with being talked at because they have to get through school. But in their leisure or free time or discretionary time, they want to be able to interact with folk. They're not going to sit there and be talked to. Many of our churches in good Protestant form have great ideas about God. Most folk today don't really care about your ideas about God, as valid as they may or may not be. They want to know, can God touch my life? And if God can't, then I don't really care what you think about God. We are, we've developed a style, I talked a little bit yesterday about Robert's Rules of Order, a very formal organizational structure. Where we sit on boards and deliberate weighty matters. And most folk today would rather have a lean and mean structure that responds actively to an issue that's of significance to them. So we've got this huge stylistic difference that blocks folk from coming in and becoming part of Christ's body. And what we are saying in effect is, it's the same issue in the New Testament church. You have to first convert to Judaism and then convert to Jesus Christ. It's what the New Testament church wrestled with and finally came around to saying, no, 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 that's not right. You can go direct to Jesus. But we say, you've got to come in out of your culture and your background and your personality and learn how we do church and then maybe we'll let you in on the secret of Jesus. I think we ought to redefine that. Okay. Enough invisible barriers. Let's go back to the two things I left hanging when we started. The church that really said they wanted to change as long as nothing was different. <laughs> the new pastor came in comes to us from a Pentecostal background, very interesting guy, and he likes to play the guitar, do choruses, and wander around, and the church, not everyone, but the majority of the church has decided they really like having a service that keeps you awake. Whoa! It's been there just a little while, but they've taken in a couple new members, and that young man who caused so much trouble has resigned. Some good things can happen. Now, again, with the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, we don't wish anyone to be out of the church. I don't want to leave that impression. But we need to give some folk over to the Lord's working in their lives. And when they're ready to get with the program, then we want to welcome them back in. But until then, we need to get on with our business. At any rate, signs of hope and health, even in a church that one would not have thought possible. And the biblical passage, the cripple was looking in unhelpful directions, wasting 38 years of his life wishing to be made whole. Then Jesus entered the scene and changed the equation, and the touch of Jesus transformed him. And I think that's the hope for our small churches. I tried to be analytical tonight and lay out things and chop them up and make them comprehensible. But it all boils down to the simple fact is the power of Jesus operative in our church. And if the answer is yes, then good things are going to happen. And if the answer is no, well, then that's our agenda. Thank you.